The Ruth Page School of Dance is a platform for developing great artists and connecting them with both audiences and community. Find audition information for the school's International Dance Experience, a four-week summer intensive featuring teaching artists from all over the world, at ruthpage.org. friends and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoin. And I'm Cadence Neenan. We are editors at Dance Media and in today's episode we'll be talking about New York City's open culture program of outdoor performances which was criticized by Actors Equity for both pay and safety issues. We'll discuss the closure of Aspen Santa Fe Ballet's performing company and also the way the organization is reimagining itself. We will get into dance artist and activist Sydney Mosley's essay about why the show doesn't necessarily have to go on right now. And then we'll have our interview with Kelly Aduce, who is the new executive director of Dance USA. Um, last week, as we mentioned on the podcast, marked the one year anniversary of this podcast. This week is the one year anniversary, almost to the day, actually, of COVID shutdowns. So we thought it would be a really fitting time to have Kelly share her bigger picture perspective on how the dance world has fared and what we've learned over the course of this strange pandemic year. And then also to talk about the invaluable work that Dance USA has been doing to support dancers and dance organizations. I mean, they've been doing that work for decades, but especially during this crisis. And Kelly's interview is actually the first in a series of conversations we'll be having with leaders from different corners of the dance world to reflect on a year of pandemic living and dancing. So stay tuned for more in that vein over the coming weeks. Um, Before we dive in, please don't forget to give us a follow on Twitter at dance underscore edit and Instagram at the.dance.edit. And also to sign up for our daily newsletter, the OG Dance Edit, which you can do at thedanceedit.com. Because if you like us talking, well, you'll probably like us typing too, especially since we tend to be better typers than talkers or To be kind, I'll say we're even better typers than talkers, (laughs) trying to be kinder to myself. Um, All right. Now it's time for our weekly dance headline rundown, and Courtney's getting it started this week. All right. So 38 members of Milan's La Scala Ballet have tested positive for COVID-19, 35 of them dancers. The outbreak followed after a single dancer tested positive at the end of February, causing the immediate cancellation of a performance filming and subsequent classes and rehearsals. I think we're all wishing them all a speedy recovery. I would also like to say this is why frequent testing is important. Mm -hmm. Yes. The Washington football team recently announced it would replace its cheerleading team with a co-ed dance team in its next season. The decision came less than one month after the Washington team reached a confidential settlement with ex-cheerleaders who unknowingly appeared in lewd videos secretly produced by team employees taken from outtakes of swimsuit calendar shoots. While leadership of the Washington team say that the decision to reassess the program was unrelated to the investigation, many former cheerleaders saw it as a punitive move, and some outside of the team even suggested that Washington team leadership may be trying to protect itself from potential gender discrimination suits in the future. Candace Carell, a 2020 team captain, said, taking opportunities away from women by adding men to this team is not a resolution. That story is many layered, Mm -hmm. obviously. We're going to link to a couple of articles in the episode description that break down more of the details. All right. uh, Queen's Gambit might be headed to the stage. Uh, Theatrical stage rights to the novel, which was adapted into a wildly popular Netflix limited series last year, have been acquired by production company Level Forward, which co-produced Broadway's Jagged Little Pill and the recent Oklahoma revival. It's early days yet. There's not even a creative team, but uh, here's hoping it's more compelling than chess was in the 80s. I mean, low bar, low bar. Chess-based choreography. <laughs> There's potential there. I see it. Ooh. Even with COVID distance spacing, I feel like we could be doing something there. S- surprisingly COVID-friendly in a way, yes. In a bizarre follow-up to The Missing Tutus at San Jose Dance Theater, it seems as though ballet costume theft is becoming a bit of a trend. 
Last week, a dance academy in Tigard, Oregon, was robbed of 40 to 50 costumes, valued at around $10,000. The costumes were intended to be used for the West Side Dance and Gymnastics Academy's upcoming performance of The Nutcracker, which was meant to be filmed this month. But in the truest spirit of the dance community, several other local studios have reached out to lend their own Nutcracker costumes and ensure that the show will be able to go on. How is this becoming a thing? Don't uh, know pl- who who steals costumes during a pandemic. Who steals them? Period. Uh, I do not understand. No. Uh, the New York Times ran a story under the headline "What Is a Ballet Body," in which critic Gia Curlis interviewed dancers like Lauren Lovett, Catherine Morgan, Erica Lal, and more as she examined what impact the pandemic's forced pause is having on dancers' relationship to weight. It provoked a lot of discussion on social media. Uh, So two things, if you plan to read this story. One, please practice care as you approach it, as there's stuff in here that is frankly horrifying and or infuriating, if not downright triggering. And two, I would encourage you to read it with a critical lens. I'm really glad that Lauren, Katie, and the rest got to share their stories more widely, but I would encourage everyone to look critically at how this reporting frames their experiences. Yeah, we actually, we're not going to get into the piece in this episode because we have several podcast episodes worth of things to say about it, I think. Um, as Courtney mentioned, a lot of people in the dance world have been feeling a lot of feelings about it. But I, I do think that it is really valuable to hear these dancers talking about weight and body image on the record in a mainstream publication, because even today that takes real courage. Mm-hmm. So we will include that link in the episode notes. Uh, French ballet star Patrick Dupont recently died at age 61. Dupont had a storied career at the Paris Opera Ballet, rising to the rank of Etoile in 1980. After leaving the company in 1985, he founded his own group called Dupont and His Stars, which toured in both Japan and France. He later returned to the Paris Opera as its dance director and made history as the youngest person ever named head of France's premier ballet company. Uh, Park Avenue Armory announced a live, in-person performance season starting this month, kicking off March 24th with the premiere of Bill T. Jones's Afterwardness. The massive 55,000-foot drill hall will be operating at 10% capacity to allow masked audience members to be placed 9 to 12 feet apart from each other, and audience members will be administered a rapid COVID-19 test upon entry at no additional cost. Um, That's only a couple of the safety precautions being taken, the armories being really, really rigorous here and they did successfully pilot their protocols back in october Mm -hmm. yeah this afterwardsness is the same production that they tested out in october with an audience of volunteer participants yeah in other exciting live performance news plays concerts and other performances may resume in new york starting in april of course this requires sharply reduced capacity limits 33 percent capacity with a limit of 100 people indoors or 200 people outdoors However, these limits can be increased to 150 people indoors or 500 people outdoors if all attendees test negative before attending. And of course, all attendees must wear face masks and be socially distanced. So that actually leads us right into our first roundtable segment, because we are now starting this strange in-between period of the pandemic where most people are not yet vaccinated, but live performances are beginning to resume. So we have to think very carefully about how we're protecting not just audience members, but especially performers. Um, And already we're seeing some problems on that front. So this past week, Actors Equity sent out a pretty scathing warning to its members about New York City's Open Culture Program, which is a series of outdoor performances on the city's streets. And the union says the city's plan does not ensure either fair wages or a safe workplace for performers involved in open culture projects. Yeah. If you don't know much about the open culture program, it's a city-sponsored program which permits outdoor cultural performances on designated city streets. Groups are able to perform in areas that were already open to the community through the New York City Open Streets program. There's a list of eligible open spaces online. It allows artists, cultural institutions, venues, and groups to stage ticketed events outdoors via an application process. And instead of going through the city's usual application process, this program allows applicants to self-certify that they're following COVID protocols and pay only $20 to apply, which all sounds great. Except when you really start to think about it, as Actors' Equity did this week, they released a serious warning to their members, saying in a letter, if you are approached to work on a New York City open culture project, please contact your business representative immediately before accepting. 
Actors' Equity points out that the city permit process established, which, you know, made simple for this program, does not require that producers pay a living wage. The permit process does not require producers provide proof of their workers' compensation insurance. The permit does not require that workers be tested for COVID-19. The permit does not require that performers be socially distanced. The permit does not have a formal requirement for a COVID-19 safety officer. And the permit process does not have appropriate safeguards to keep crowds distanced from the workers. So it seems as though in simplifying this permit process, the city is putting performers at risk. Well, and I think it's very important to actually take a look at what this program was intended to do and what it was meant to do, because what this program is not is a commissioning program. It is not that. Mm -hmm. There is basically no funding for this program whatsoever. What it does, what it exists to do, is to essentially, as Cadence said, it allows groups to apply for permits in a much easier, much more straightforward manner than typically applying for permits to perform outdoors would be. Um, The fact that the people who are putting on these performances can collect donations or sell tickets for these events is actually due to advocacy to the New York City Council on behalf Mm -hmm. of artists to allow them to do that, because normally that would be its own set of red tape to get past. So the fact that that is even being allowed is great. But again, what this is not is a commissioning program. This is essentially designed for groups to be able to cut through red tape so that those smaller groups uh, can be out there doing performances. But I think they're absolutely right in pointing out that like this does raise a lot of safety issues. It does leave a lot of stuff in the hands of the people producing the performances, in the hands of performers themselves who oftentimes don't have that power, and a little bit to audiences uh, for them Mm -hmm. to be respectful and to be paying attention to regulations. So essentially in super streamlining this process to get rid of some bureaucratic red tape, kind of the buck is being passed a little bit to the artists who are strapped and trying to just make this work happen potentially safely. Right. There is no money. That's like the root of the problem with this program. Mm -hmm. There is no money to support it. Um, It actually, it feels like the problem with a lot of the government art support programs that we've seen so far is that they're thinking about things mostly from an audience perspective mm-hmm. rather than an artist perspective. This idea of big public performances that can uplift a whole community, which is valid. They can big public performances absolutely can do that. But and I think what you're referencing here, Margaret, is a separate program, which is Andrew Cuomo's State New York Pops Up Performance Series, uh, which just kicked off and which. Uh, essentially has a lot of really big headliners doing pop-up performances as well as pilot testing uh, safety features for places like Park Avenue Armory and Broadway theaters to reopen at reduced capacity. Right. And it's interesting to note that Equity actually approves of the New York Pops Up series, the state's program, because it does have some better pay and safety programs in place. Well, because that is a case where it is actual specific performances that are being put on the docket by New Mm -hmm. York State and by the people doing this program. Which, again, is not what open culture is. (laughs) But I think so the link in terms of what the the fundamental problem with both of those programs, the reason that artists are upset about both of those programs is because the people doing the performing are not getting the lion's share of the resources devoted to these programs. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think and also for Pops Up, there is kind of a sense, even though there's not a full list of who's participating, what has been released are people who financially are Probably fairly Don't okay. Need this <laughs> uh, it's it's people who are gonna get audiences excited to hear about them, mm-hmm. but the equitable mm-hmm. distribution of those, say, commissioning funds. Hmm? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think what I find just frustrating about this whole situation with the open culture program is that again, it is leadership in the city and the government expecting other people to, in my mind, do their job. I don't think that performers or leadership at dance companies are experts on how to best set things up during a pandemic. I don't think that that is their responsibility. And I think putting that onus on performers, on leadership at dance organizations, on creative artists seems irresponsible and a little frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do better by your artists, government-sponsored art programs. Mm -hmm. Do better by the artists themselves. Like, we are starting to see some recognition of artists as workers. Can we more, please? More. More and better. Yes. So in our next segment, we're going to talk about a piece of news that really hit the dance world hard this past week. 
uh, Aspen Santa Fe Ballet announced that it would be closing its widely respected performing company. And in many ways, it was just a heartbreaking announcement. The company was home to so many gifted dancers. It's been a fixture on the concert dance circuit for 25 years. But This is where things get interesting. Though the company has faced significant pandemic-related losses, this actually is not a bankruptcy story. Instead, Aspen Santa Fe Ballet has decided to put its remaining resources toward, first of all, the company's schools, which are not closing, and then toward a new fund that's intended to help support the broader dance community. So it's this interesting reimagining of the organization, and it's the type of thing that I think we'll probably be seeing more of as more dance companies have to make hard choices. Well, and I think something that absolutely fascinates me as a news editor was getting the press release about this, and I would like to read Mm -hmm. what the first sentence of the press release is. Uh, Today, Aspen Santa Fe Ballet announced the launch of the Aspen Santa Fe Ballet Fund for Innovation in Dance, a new component of the nonprofit organization that will share knowledge, forge connections, and provide resources and support to artists and organizations within the field of dance. It is not until the third paragraph of this release that the news that Aspen Santa Fe Ballet, the company, Mm -hmm. the professional performing arm of the organization, would cease to exist. Um, The dancers have been furloughed since September. Uh, They were officially let go uh, about a week before this announcement was made. And so it's a really interesting way of positioning this decision that's been made. And in this release, they the directors are very straightforward about saying, like, you know, this isn't something that we decided on a whim. This is something that we put a lot of thought and care and attention into making this choice. It was ultimately a financial choice, but this financial choice is one that's going to allow all of their educational initiatives to continue and hopefully, they think, uh, evolve the nonprofit into something that will kind of helped change the game for other mid-sized touring companies in the U.S., which Aspen Santa Fe Ballet was one of the most recognizable of its kind. I do feel as though somehow that press release reflects the decision-making process itself, that the decision was made that instead of attempting to stay in business while they were unable to perform and risk depleting the organization's endowment, the organization decided that it was time to sort of call it and decide where they could best put their financial resources. It really does seem like it was this well thought out, very intentional decision on their part. That said, my heart does break a little bit. Like Aspen Santa Fe Ballet was the first professional dance company I ever saw in person. Mm -hmm. Uh, They toured for my hometown when I was in middle school. And like that was life changing. My heart breaks for the dancers. Mm -hmm. Like I, it's interesting because Making a preemptive move to close down a performing arm, that's something I personally at least didn't anticipate happening as like a first step in response to pandemic losses. I think there's kind of this older school way of thinking um, about a dance organization as you protect that performing company, the high profile like face of the institution at all costs. Like even if it is a loss leader, you protect it. But maybe this Aspen Santa Fe ballet model is something that we'll see more frequently going forward or... Maybe there'll be modified versions of it, like having the performing company go dormant for a while so you can shift those resources then to the affiliated school, something like what Dance Theater of Harlem did Mm. for almost a decade. And then they did successfully relaunch their performing arm. But that felt like a tragedy, too. I I just, where are these dancers? Where are these incredibly talented dancers going to go? Yeah. Just fewer jobs for dancers. Which Aspen Santa Fe, they did kind of, I don't think they've entirely shut the door on the possibility Mm -hmm. of that touring company coming Mm -hmm. back. Um, Mm -hmm. Like there was no like, and this will never be a thing again. Like, (laughs) you know, I think the door is still open there a few years down the line when maybe things have stabilized a little bit. Yeah, the exact quote, uh, the executive director said, and when it's possible, we will be bringing great dance back to Colorado and New Mexico. So I feel like that door is open there yeah or at least as a presenter they can continue to do that too because that was part of their programming too Mm -hmm. it's like the same way when like cedar lake folded right and you're just like and there's a bunch of incredible dancers who are now looking for work okay Mm -hmm. yeah it's just a gut punch and we knew they were coming but it hurts it hurts so in our last roundtable segment we want to talk about a like big deep breath of an essay that artist and activist and writer Sidney Mosley recently wrote for Dance Magazine. And the title is, I have no desire to produce a performance live or live streamed until the pandemic is over. I'll wait. 
which like a moment of appreciation for that title. The essay gets into the fallacy of the dance world show must go on mentality, which we've talked about a lot on this podcast, because as Mosley says, the show doesn't actually have to go on right now. We're living through a massive crisis. We're practicing an art form that for many of us depends on sharing physical space in a way that is not currently safe. So dancers cannot and should not be expected to figure out a way to keep creating just for the sake of creating. It's, you know, it's one of those essays that we all nodded along to so enthusiastically that we ended up with neck cramps at the end. (laughs) Yeah, well, and I think something to emphasize here is that I think it's easy to hear the like, nut graph version of this and be like, oh, well, she's saying we shouldn't be doing all this pivoting digital performance. And that's not actually Sydney's Mm -hmm. point. The point is essentially to challenge us and to ask yourself, am I doing this because it is an authentic reflection and evolution of my practice? Or am I doing this because I feel like I have to do this because everyone else is doing it? Mm -hmm. Uh, Like an actual sentence in the story is, please do what works for you. Mm -hmm. I could just quote this entire essay. It's so good. Everyone, please go (laughs) read it. Um, But she at one point referenced like as we're going into year two of this pandemic which was a really tough clause to read but (laughs) uh she proposed some questions to ask that we should be asking ourselves and it's things like am i creating digital work because it's truly in service of my mission and values or just because that's what everyone else is doing right now and how am i creating space to honor grief for the projects that were lost or canceled or are now shape-shifting Um, There's more questions in that line that are talking not only about artistic health, but personal health and emotional health and mental health and really holding space for doing what you as an artist need and as a human need right now. For me, I think the question that was the most poignant was literally just, what if we rested? I think I like took a deep, deep breath when I read that question because it is not one that I imposed very often. Sydney isn't saying that we shouldn't be dancing, we shouldn't be earning money, because obviously for most of us, both of those things are imperative. She's just inviting all of us to let go of the pressure to produce something just for the sake of it. She says that we don't need to be producing to keep up with the Joneses or maintain relevance. We should be dancing because and if we need to dance. And I also think it's interesting that she talks about still being in process with her own company. But anytime someone asks, well, what are you rehearsing for? Her rebuttal is, well, we value the process. Rehearsal is a ritual. This Mm -hmm. is a space that we hold for each other. And I think that's just magnificent. Mm -hmm. Also, I have a company of dancers that wants to do work and that needs to get paid. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I am holding rehearsal. (laughs) Yeah, I love that she mentioned that great meme that mrs smith the musician mrs smith made it's been going all around instagram she just said a pandemic is not a residency Uh this idea that you know have a lot of artists had more free time than usual yes does that mean their life has been conducive to creativity no no for most of us the opposite is true this is a moment of trauma we should be allowed to as cadence brought up we should be allowed to rest or invest in other sides of ourselves, or, you know, find other paid work to do to make up for our lost income Mm -hmm. from all these canceled in-person projects. I, you know, Dance Teacher actually published an essay by choreographer Al Blackstone that is thematically connected to Sydney's essay. It was an expansion of an Instagram post that Al put out a few weeks back that went viral, where he spotlighted dancers who are exhausted or put off by a virtual dance class who are waiting for in-person classes to resume. And he wanted to let all those people know that they're still valued and loved and missed, that there is a hole in the dance community where they used to be that is felt deeply. They haven't just disappeared. And the sense that there's no shame in not being an online class person, just as there is no shame in not being interested in making digital dance. So much of what we value about dance is dependent on in-person alchemy that's worth waiting for i'm resisting the urge to start like crooning the room where it happens um (laughs) like it's 2016 i need to be stopped (laughs) simpler times never stop never stop um anyway as we said it's it's almost silly for us to be paraphrasing sydney's writing Mm -hmm. please just go read it yourself we'll link to it in the show notes and we're actually we're gonna have sydney on the podcast in a few weeks to talk more about all of these ideas So so excited for that stay tuned yes All right. 
Speaking of interviews with brilliant people, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll have our interview with Kelly Duce. Stay tuned. Welcome back, dance friends. I'm here now with Kelly Aduse, who is the new executive director of Dance USA, which has been an invaluable resource for the dance community, I mean, for a long time, but especially during the challenges of the past year. And we have a lot to talk about today. But Kelly, hi, first of all. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, before we get into the list of questions, would you mind telling our listeners a little bit about yourself and about your relationship with dance? Sure, sure. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much for having me um, in this podcast episode. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I started off dancing as a young girl, I think, as most arts administrators or dancers would say. And I danced all through um, my childhood. And I actually went to, to college and, and received degree in dance as well as black studies. So I had a dual degree. And then when I graduated, I, I knew that I wanted to be on the supporting end of, of the industry. And I did not want to, to be on the stage behind the scenes rather. And so I found Dance USA and I've been with the organization. This is actually my 13th year with Dance USA. Um, but I've been in my role as executive director for about just just a couple of months now. So, Can you talk a little bit about, first of all, what the organization's mission is, and then about what your job is as executive director? Sure, of course. So first, I want to start off by um, sharing Dance with Day's vision. Um, dance with Day's vision is propelled by our belief that dance can inspire a more just and humane world. Dance USA amplifies the power of dance to inform and inspire a nation where creativity and the field thrive. And so our mission is to champion an inclusive and equitable dance field by leading, convening, advocating, and supporting individuals and organizations. And we do that through um, our four core programs, which is uh, engagement, advocacy, research, and preservation. So with engagement, we are activating our member networks through meaningful programming, convenings, and educational opportunities. And then when it comes to our advocacy, we are advocating for increased visibility of and engagement in the dance community with our government officials and policies um, to positively impact the field on a national, regional, and local level. And then with our research, we are providing rigorous, relevant, and accessible research to the dance field. And our preservation is really focused on providing resources and programs to advance the archiving and preservation of America's dance legacy. So um, I just wanna also add that it's really important for our member community and the field to understand that we also um, conduct all of our work through a set of core values which are creativity, connectivity, equity, and integrity with a, a strong keen focus on equity and justice. Um, that is, that's really central to our work. So when it comes to my job as executive director um, of Dance USA, it's to be laser focused on these priorities and our mission and our vision and balancing being responsive to the needs of the field while also encouraging and perhaps maybe at times urging the field to, to open itself up to new ideas and concepts. I kind of look at my role um, within the dance ecosystem and with Dance USA as being a place where we are helping to support the way for the, for the field to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, and to say that you stepped into this role at a difficult time is Maybe the understatement of the year. Um, we're yeah. we're at almost almost exactly the one year anniversary of COVID shutdowns, which is this strange milestone. Yes. How have you seen the dance community first of all rise to the pandemic's challenges, and then what problems within dance has COVID kind of laid bare? Yeah. Um, so I would say that what I have observed in terms of the field rising sort of to the occasion um, or the realities of COVID is pivoting to the online space. I think a lot of folks will talk about switching their um, their seasons or their 
performances, their festivals to an online platform, figuring that out, making it meaningful, um, adapting really quickly to what that looks like and reimagining um, what performances look like, what festivals look like in an online manner. And I would also add administrative teams. I mean, we are, uh, cr we are creatures that love to be together, right? <laughs> and really having to adapt, okay, how do we now work when we're not physically present um, with one another? So I, that's, that's, one, that's one area. Um, another I would say is I've seen the field um, sort of recenter, refocus its, its attention and its care around artists. Um, you know, many organizations that, that had the capacity to do so, they um, started funds to support their dancers and artists connected to their organizations. There are lots of um, local dance service organizations that, you know, made a, uh, took a concerted effort to uh, create community-wide funds for the artists in their communities. Um, there were funders that stepped up to do that for the dance field. And then I would also say, uh, and this goes, this is just another example of, of the centering of artists and thinking about um, how we are uh, supporting the creatives in our field. Within the Dance with Say member community, we had two of our peer groups come together and create an equitable contracting document. And the two groups are um, members from our Dance USA agents, managers, producers, promoters peer group, and um, with our presenters peer group. So multidisciplinary and dance specific presenters. And it's really incredible. I mean, this document will, will be live on the Dance USA website soon. Um, and I really, I'm just so impressed by the work that they have done to help the field reimagine how we might create a more equitable contracts um, when working with artists. I've seen in our member community, a deeper commitment um, of collegiality among our members um, with one another. Since March of last year, we have been having all 18 of our member networks connecting on a, on a really regular basis, some connecting weekly, bi-weekly, monthly. And I just have been so astounded by, um, by the support, the ideating, the problem solving, that they have done with one another in this time that's you know really kind of taken us all aback. And then advocacy. As I mentioned earlier, advocacy is one of Dance with Day's core services since its founding in 1982. So for over 30 some years, it's been at the heart of what we um, were founded to do. And Dance with Day represents its membership and the field in front of Congress, federal agencies and the White House. We do all of our advocacy work in a bipartisan manner um, in a coalition with other nonprofit performing arts organizations. And to be quite honest, like COVID has given us, uh, it has allowed us really to more deeply engage our members in the field in our advocacy work. We've witnessed over 7,000 and that number continues to tick up. Uh, letters that have gone to um, congressional leaders uh, around the country where the dance field is saying we need support on these federal packages. So it's been really wonderful, I guess is the best word to use. It's been really wonderful to, to see the, the field um, really step up, lean into our federal advocacy work and insert their voice more strongly and pointedly into what's happening on Capitol Hill. And I've also witnessed some really courageous choices um, during this time. It's, I think COVID provided some, an opportunity to kind of slow down a little bit and recenter their values and, and focus on what's really important to them and make different choices about their operations um, and their artistic output. And I think it's a, a very courageous to, to in this moment, make a pivot, um, whether it is to, you know, increase in some areas or maybe decrease in other areas, let some parts of the organization go dormant for some time um, until they're able to reemerge. I know that it may be hard, but I think it's been a really courageous choice from, from some that I've, that I've witnessed. You asked the question as well about 
what has kind of laid to bear during this time, I would say that mm -hmm. first, you know, I think many industries <laughs> were taken aback during this time. Um, and it, I think COVID exposed a lot of fractures and a lot of systems that we're operating in, um, not simply the dance ecosystem. And that being said, I think some of the things that I've elevated as, as the field having risen to the to the challenge, I would also say they rose to the challenge in those ways because it was because what was revealed were things that needed to be addressed and us leaning into more. So Dance USA did a big COVID impact survey last spring, and you're about to launch a second one now. What were the, the biggest takeaways from the first survey? Yeah, so yes, we did. We conducted our impact survey last March, um, and we are planning to launch another one this March. So literally a year later. For your listeners, I, I will also, I'm happy to provide a link uh, later on for the show notes for folks Great. to be able to access the the, um, the survey. Those yeah, that we'll are include that. great, we deeply desire to have a strong understanding as to, by way of data, as to how uh, COVID has truly impacted the dance ecosystems. And the survey captured individual and organizational responses Round two, we'll do that as well. Some of the, 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 the big takeaways from the first one around uh, expected total loss revenue by the end of June, 2020. Of those that responded to the survey, and this is from an organizational standpoint, of those that responded to the survey, about 40% reported a combined total loss of ticketing revenues of about $75,000 in terms of projected percent loss of budget revenue, when it came to earn income, um, the median percent loss is about 24%. And when it came to contributed income, it was about uh, 10%. And then the other major takeaway, which I think really will come as no surprise to you or, or your listeners, 41% of individuals were confident that they could still be able to work but 59% indicated that they could not find another way of working um, to gain income. Those numbers really resonate with me because I think that they reflect the reality of the impact of COVID when it first happened. Mm -hmm. And I think it's continually being reflected as to the response um, of local funds for artists of national funders leaning in a, a bit to help support and, and create new programs for, um, for artists to receive funds. And it's just definitely demonstrated an impact on the individual artists, dancers, and choreographers. So I, I'm curious to know how that, how a year later, how that number, how these numbers might change, but those are um, some pretty big takeaways from the first survey, which perhaps don't come as any surprise. Yeah, and I don't I don't want to ask you to, you know, be a fortune teller, but what changes have you seen since the first survey that might impact the second survey? That's a really good question. Um, I think that the biggest thing probably is related to openings, mm -hmm. right? So like as states have started to reopen, our I'm noticing our member community also starting to reopen and discuss reopening. So I think that that might be the biggest. The other, and when I say the biggest, I'm thinking of like the schools, maybe not in-person performances, but you know, the online content that has been generated and the conversations around monetizing that, that content. It could also be some in-person, very small performances that have been able to happen with uh, strict protocols. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking... I'm curious to know the, the ideas that were implemented, you know, that pivot that I was talking about earlier, if the pivots that were made um, have sort of helped the bottom line over time. Mm -hmm. So jumping into a, a giant topic, the so the killing of George Floyd last spring and the protests that followed, it seemed to belatedly, finally, shake a lot of dance organizations awake. How have you, from your perspective, seen racism shape the dance industry? And what steps need to be taken to move the industry toward equity? 
Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> I know, I know it's huge. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's a really meaty topic um, and question that you pose. And honestly, one that I believe cannot be responded to in a vacuum. I, I think as it, you know, as it relates to the dance field, when we think about racism, we really do have to, to understand it as a structure that our entire country and our lives are built on. Um, racism has been institutionalized in this country, in the world. Racism is not invisible. It is real. <laughs> and it's a structure, a lens that we are living our lives uh, daily, making choices daily. It impacts our work and our relationships. None of us living today created the structure, but every single day we are paying into it um, at some point and in one form or another. I think we all need to understand that in order to combat it, in order to undo racism, in order to address racist practices, shift our ideologies, address white supremacy culture, and how those characteristics um, show up in the nonprofit sector, understanding white privilege does exist, um, that it is real, and that our society constantly centers whiteness. To counter all that, I, I think that we need to understand a few things that these structures, they harm everyone, no matter what one's assigned race may be. We need to educate ourselves on, on our country's history and really face the realities of our country's history. Seeking anti-racist training and um, having a greater awareness of different ways of being that are anti-racist. Being aware and understanding our implicit and explicit biases. We need to be incredibly intentional about how we live, what choices we make, our relationships, how we show up in our workplace and ask ourselves why. I, I will just say that I know that around that, when George Floyd was murdered, and I'll just also offer Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey, Tamir Rice, Eric Gardner, uh, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, I mean, the list goes on, but in particular, um, when Mr. Floyd was was murdered, we at Dance USA, our team, we asked ourselves, like, how are we showing up to work? How are we supporting one another? Um, how is this a supportive place for us to all be with one another? You know, we have work to do. We are here to support the dance ecosystem. We are committed <laughs> to doing our work and supporting this this field. But are we seeing one another and really kind of leaning into to the weight of that um, collectively? And so I also think that we need to kind of also understand the notion of how power may play out in our lives and in our work and in the dance field. I think being better allies um, might also be a path forward, committing to action and not lip service. We have to be careful and mindful that, you know, transformative equity work is not it's not, a, it's not a box that you're checking off, right? It's continual. So it's, a, it's almost like a taking off a cloak and choosing actively to put on a new one. I also just want to take a moment to kind of go back to Dance USA's core values. We strive to remove the boundaries erected by a legacy of racism, classism, ableism, ageism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, gender bias and xenophobia, and we work to dismantle institutional and systemic oppression that attack the dance field's progress, impeding the creation of work and negatively impacting dance audiences and communities. So while we talk about racism, um, I also want to elevate those other isms and not forget them because they do permeate our, our field and they show up um, in our society every day. That actually leads into my next, unfortunately, also huge question, which is what are the other bigger picture issues that you think the dance world needs to address right now? What's sort of top of mind for you? Yeah, I'm not quite sure how to address this now. Um, but one thing that that is very much on my mind um, is, is the mental health, mm -hmm. mental health of dancers and mental health of administrators. Um, and when I say dancers, I, I am talking about, I guess, if we think in the, in the company context, independent artists, um, dance makers, choreographers, but I'm also 
thinking about the students. Um, there's, when we think about the future of the art form, there is some, some need and some care that needs to be centered around students and, and, and what the future will look like. Yeah, as we start to emerge from our homes and we start to be around people again in, in, in large crowds, you know, we've got to be cognizant as to how we are uh, showing up for one another, how we're taking care of one another. Um, my hope is that we'll lean into um, this notion of empathy with, with greater intent um, and, and lead always with understanding for others, um, really seeing one another as human. Um, the other is our relationship to the environment. Um, again, huge topic, <laughs> still trying to wrap my head around that, but I, I think we need to be very cognizant of the art form's relation, the art form and uh, I suppose our lives, like the way that we, we are living and working um, to the environment around us. This might seem kind of nebulous, but being prepared, <laughs> uh, you know, how are organizations preparing for the unexpected? I mean, it's not, again, COVID, I think, knocked us all on our sides. So not saying that we should be spinning our wheels and, and thinking of like the next pandemic, but how are we being prepared for the unexpected? Are we taking a moment to sort of pause and slow down and reflect and, and think more long-term, like three to, to five years out? where it's not tied to a strategic plan, but being really thoughtful about how the organization may be moving forward or, um, and the choices that we're making around those plans. And then I, I really love this other idea, which is what's coming up for me as well, is this, this notion of us asking what if questions and really saying, you know, what if we tried this? And what if this is not possible? What if we partnered with X community, what would that look like? How would that feel? What if we stopped doing X, Y, Z? Um, and I offer that uh, just as a planting a seed because I wonder like what we would have tried before COVID may have happened that would have maybe made this moment in our collective history perhaps a bit easier to, to move through. So... Thank you for focusing two enormous questions that I just asked you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'll I'll ask a slightly more more narrow question now. You are planning the Dance USA annual conference, which is coming up soon, its second virtual conference. Can you talk a little bit about the goals for this year's conference and the various topics that it's going to address? Absolutely. Not that narrow, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, and and sort of in line with some of the things that I, I have already shared. Our goals for Dance Music convenings always, no matter if they are happening in person or in the virtual space, is to bring the, the dance community together, giving folks an opportunity to connect or reconnect, to um, get re-energized, to ideate with one another, to ask provoking questions of themselves, of their colleagues, to problem solve to have some fun, <laughs> you know, like let's bring the joy into our work. I, I think it's no surprise that some of the major themes that are starting to emerge, COVID, COVID's effects on the field and the future of the field. I mean, no surprise there. Emergency preparedness, also probably no surprise there. Climate change and sustainability, conversations around equity, marketing and fundraising and wellness uh, with um, a specific focus on how to support mental health in the field. Um, I am, I'm really excited for this year's um, conference and I'm sad that we're not going to be in person, um, but I'm, I'm really thrilled that we're gonna be able to continuing, continuing to create a space for the field to come together for these really important conversations. Mm -hmm. Zooming way out again. Yeah. <laughs> What makes you hopeful about the future of dance right now? And you've kind of touched on this a little bit already, but. Yeah, I am. I am really hopeful because I believe that there are infinite possibilities for the future. We've got an opportunity to 
make different choices. And I think that those choices can go in many different directions and, and there's so many different pathways forward. And I'm excited by that. Um, I also think that, you know, I'm, I guess what also gives me hope is that there are individuals in our field that are truly wanting to, to see um, different choices be made um, that are really centering racial equity not just in their own personal lives, but in the community um, and supporting those who have been marginalized. I am inspired by the activists in our field who have eloquently, um, you know, are arousing the field to wake up a bit more to be to the inequities in our field and encouraging more people to say no, never again, or no, not anymore. Um, to racism and, and institutionalized systems of oppression. Um, I'm also inspired by how I have witnessed our member community um, and the performing arts sector just come together in one of the darkest, <laughs> confusing, complex times in modern history. So how people are really showing up for one another. Um, I just, it's inspiring, you know, it, it keeps me getting up every day and, um, being here present with um, our members and with the field and, and really thinking of how can we continue to shift ourselves forward. Yeah. It's a strange period where we've never been more isolated, but it also feels like we've never been more connected. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That is so, so true. So true. And supportive. I mean, I, I can't yeah. tell you how many conversations start off with how are you doing and not that sense of, um, you know, how are you doing and let's move on very quickly or I'm right. And the answer is fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like, really, how are you doing? And you spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes on talking about how you're really doing. So. Kelly, thank you so much for sharing your perspective, sharing your insight, really valuable for our listeners. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, where uh, We'll include links to the COVID impact survey and to the Dance USA website yeah. to make sure that people can, our listeners can access all of those things. Are there any social handles or any other places that people should go to find out more about Dance USA and the projects you're working on? Yes. And we can provide those also in, in the show notes. Okay, great. Yeah. We'll do that. Make it easy. Yeah. Thank you so much again, Kelly. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks again to Kelly. As promised, we have included the link to the New Dance USA survey, which you should please go take right now. That's in the episode description. Also links to all of the organizations, various social accounts are in there. Um, for easy reference, the Instagram and Twitter handles are both at danceusa.org, O-R-G. And Kelly also asked that we link to an important resource that lays out the characteristics of white supremacy culture as they show up in our organizations. You can find that link in the episode notes as well. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining us. We will be back next week for more discussion of the news moving the dance world. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Mind how you go, friends. Bye, everyone. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Neenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those football sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.